Can I open it up? Rhodochrosite. Okay, so let's see. My glasses are really dirty. Rhodochrosite, it's known for like this really bright red. So Rhodochrosite, I know it's the state gem of Colorado. I think it's the national gem of Argentina. Argentina is known for like banded Rhodochrosite and I think it looks like bacon. Do we have any bacon? Is there bacon in here? Forget it though, we got Rhodochrosite, so my life is complete. There's also some really cool specimens found in South Africa. They have like this really cool terminated edge, they're fantastic specimens, like kind of this like bright, fiery red, absolutely fantastic. But Colorado is actually one of the more famous sources, the Sweet Home Mine near Alma, Colorado. All of you fans out there know that we've actually already done a Rhodochrosite video before, but this one's gonna be just a tad bit different. And by tad bit, I mean we're actually leaving the studio. I'm taking you to Colorado and the gray box is coming with me. Ladies and gentlemen, we are unboxing in a Rhodochrosite mine. Excited? Let's do this. Okay, this is way better. The white table, it's okay. But I was getting really, really sick of that black background. So guys, I'm in Colorado right now. I'm actually facing the Rhodochrosite mine that we were in earlier, and I've got my trusty gray box. So today, we're not just gonna talk gray boxes in Rhodochrosite, I'm actually gonna bring Brian in. He's an expert on Rhodochrosite, really knows the mining business, he's a geologist, and we're gonna talk about what makes Rhodochrosite so cool. We're gonna talk about the mining. We're gonna talk about the history of the area and why this is so prolific. I know Rhodochrosite, it's gonna have those big beautiful crystals, the great red color that I have fallen in love with. Wow. Okay, so this was quite a bit bigger than what I was expecting. As I said before, this is from Brian's collection. So you can see that rhombohedral crystal shape, which I absolutely love. My first thought is, wow, that color. I mean, look at this shot right here, guys. I've got a beautiful mountain. Um, tons of greenery, rhodochrosite. I know you love the yellow hard hat. So what I noticed first is I can, you know, the bright color, but you can also see these lines. And we're gonna talk to Brian a little bit more about the specimen and why he chose this specimen. What's great about this is it's pretty transparent. You can see through it. That color is just fantastic. Right there on the side, I see some, what looks like gold, but knowing this area and what we learned from Brian in the mine on the travel vlog, it's pyrite. This is definitely a specimen. I would never set this in jewelry. It is far too beautiful to be messed with. And thank you to Brian already for this, this fantastic piece. So after the plane ride to get here and, and, and driving to this mine, my patience is running low. And I am just excited to hear what Brian has to say about the mine, this area, and why he chose this really cool rhodochrosite piece. So I'm gonna bring him on in. Hey, Brian. Hello, Thank how you doing? Thank you so much for joining me. I'm gonna tell you right now, this is probably the, the coolest unboxing I've done so far because I have this in the background and I'm looking at the mine. You've got a pretty awesome job, you know that? It's, it's just really difficult to walk up to work look at this every day and be able to go underground and possibly find something like some this. Some critters running around too. And we I have mean, critters, we have a wonderful wildlife and abundance up here. All right, so we've talked a little bit about rhodochrosite. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about this area. What makes it so important for rhodochrosite? And I will admit, this is definitely one of my favorites too. <laughs> okay, well I would agree, but I'm not biased at all. This area has a, a rich history of mining. It started okay. back in the 1860s. Colorado had a big gold boom. It started in 1859, and the prospectors came up to this area. And what you see above us, that stained ground, that rusty looking ground, drew the miners here because they saw that and they saw mineralized ground. So, oh, well, if it's rusty like that, there could be gold, there could be silver. So they started putting tunnels in here and they okay. laid in claims and they established several claims in this area that were ultimately put together into one big claim group called the Sweet Home Group. And that consolidation went on over a period of about 75 years to develop actually what they call the Sweet Home property, which we're sitting right in the middle of. When you get up here and you look at the expanses and you go underground, you realize that um, we're really just scratching the surface for mm -hmm. these crystals. So you talked about silver mining. Mm -hmm. When did this kind of area switch from silver to rhodochrosite? What caused that? While they were mining silver, mm -hmm. they actually would find rhodochrosite. But 100, 150 years ago, it didn't have much commercial value. People still collected it. It ended up in museums and collectors, and people became curious about the area. And famous mineralogists came through here and would take pieces back to museums like the Harvard, where you can see crystals that were collected back in the 19th century on display. Eventually, through the early 1900s, they started finding more, more collecting started happening. This whole hobby started to grow, and it culminated in 1966 when 
Right at the end of the silver mining, silver mining was really waning. The, the owners of the mine thought, hey, you know, this, this funny little red crystal, people seem to want to own one of these things. Let's go look for them. So they, that, that was kind of the, that was the tipping point. And they actually started looking for rhodochrosite. Indeed, they found some in 1966, and they found crystals gemmy quality like that and even bigger than this one. That was the find that made this mine famous. And then ever since 1966, people have been trying to figure out a way to get back in here and open it up and, and mine for more of these. So that was the tipping point, 1966. 1966, okay, so tell me a little bit about what happened between 1966 and 2018 and how you got hooked into Rotocrosite. I'm a mineral collector. If you're a mineral collector, you know about this mineral. And as I got into the hobby and then into the business, I realized that I wanted to mine for mineral specimens and that really hadn't been done much before. You don't usually hard rock mine for minerals. You hard rock mine for ores, you know, like gold, zinc, lead. And minerals were always a byproduct of mining. What we decided to do was actually go after rhodochrosite, a hard rock mine, as the primary product of mining. Back in about 1989, the owner of the mine really wanted to reopen it and had the same kind of idea, well, what if we look for, for rhodochrystals? And he and I got together and formulated a plan. It took us two years, and we reopened the mine the first time in 1991, and then it was called the Sweet Home Mine. So there's hard rock and soft rock. Soft rock mining would be mining for something like coal, which obviously is soft. It forms in an environment where the rock is a lot softer. Hard rock mining is usually in things like granite, where you have to drill holes, you have to use a lot of explosives to break the rock and move it out of the way to get to your pocket. So mm -hmm. that's hard rock mining. So I know rhodochrosite is formed hydrothermal. So can you tell me a little bit about this area and why there's hydrothermal veins here? What makes it so special? So the, the rock is over a billion years old that we're, that so we're standing on. That's a billion with a B. Wow, a billion with a B. That's crazy. Very, very old rock but it was deep, under, deep, deep, deep underground. Okay. And over time in Colorado, that rock was pushed up. And after it was done being pushed up or in the process of being pushed up, the rock was cracked and fractured. Those cracks and fractures forms faults. And okay. you know about the California fault system that right. moved once in a while? San Andreas. San yeah. Andreas, okay. It's a similar kind of a thing, but this is in the, in the hard rocks of Colorado Mountain. And what happened after the rocks fractured and created that pattern, millions of years later, we're talking a long time later and not so much distant, 30, we talked about this before, 33 million years ago, uh -huh. these fluids came up into the cracks and they mineralized this whole region. And that's what got every, all the miners excited about coming here and digging for gold and silver. Wow. And it's hydrothermal, hydrothermal veins. And hydro is just water, thermal is heat. Cool. So what happens is water deep underground, it's hot, it's under pressure, it dissolves minerals, and it brings them to the surface, and they crystallize. And the water comes up as it cools, it cools slowly, okay. and suddenly the minerals start to come out of the water and form inside these cracks where there's open space. Now, I know if it cools slowly, bigger crystals and quickly smaller crystals, is that true? Well, that's what the chemistry experiments show us, yeah. like when you crystallize sugar. But we actually don't know how long it takes to grow a rhodochrosite. We don't, we don't know if it took a million years or if it took a day. Can you tell me a little bit about, what is a typical day like for a miner? It took us two years to get this set up like you see it, right? Okay. We drove a tunnel. 450, 500 feet into the mountain, okay. we, and we hit the vein. So now what we do every day, we go into the mine, we clean out the rock from the previous day's blast, we set the drills back up, and we probe the vein. Probing the vein means drilling into the vein to make sure there's no voids or open space. And if there's no voids or open space, then we drill the rest of the holes, it's called a round, then we'll shoot again. Those holes are eight feet deep. Now, if they hit a pocket, things completely change. So a void would be, would show you that you hit a pocket. You hit a pocket. And when you hit a void, the drill jumps. And when you're drilling, you're on that big, heavy drill. Suddenly it leaps. And that's and, when you hit something And that's good. when you hit something. And then you've got to pull back on it fast because inadvertently you've, you could drill right through some of the best crystals Does in the whole pocket. Does that make you nervous when you're drilling? Uh -huh. Are you, I mean, this is an absolutely beautiful piece. You could drill right through that. You could that. drill through it that or would... it's brothers and sisters or all of them. We've drilled into pockets by accident and ruined every crystal in the pocket because, you know, the pocket's only this big. Make you feel not good. Not good. <laughs> Sometimes you go a year between finding a pocket, but the but the payoff pockets here aren't even that big. They may be an inch or two wide, and maybe two uh, foot and a half, two feet in diameter. So maybe the size small. of that gray box. A pocket could be the size, but but lots thinner. Pockets are never that thick or that wide. So now that we're talking about the size of that box, you want to see what's in yeah, it? Yeah, I definitely okay. do. <laughs> There's more learning to be had. With you know, this I like specimen. my guests to do the unboxing. Oh, you so. like me to open it? Yeah, I get you're to be the you're a guest. Okay, be well, my guest. Holy guacamole, that is, that so this is, is. This is like a little jewel box. Yeah, you can say that again. I see the rhodochrosite, I see some pyrite. I'm guessing that's quartz right there. Those are quartz the little crystals. tiny little guys. Yes. And what's the black? The black is a tetrahedrite crystal that has a little bit of antimony in it. Why did you choose these pieces for unboxing? Because I've seen your collection, guys, and it's huge. Why these well, two? Well, I wanted to give an example of how big the crystals get and how, 
how good the quality is and how gemmy they get. You could actually cut a gemstone out of that crystal. Oh, heavens. You wouldn't, yeah. though. No, it's too collectible. It's too You'd destroy the crystal. Crystals on Matrix are actually more collectible than crystals off Matrix to the mineral collector. Have you seen our channel before? We do gemologists versus geologists. As a gemologist, guys, I want this. And I would love if it would cleave and I could, you know, make some earrings out of this. As a geologist, you like this because like of this one because this. you're the collector. So you talked about the beginning of the mine, how there was a lot of silver. Do you find silver now? Or are you only lucky enough to find these kind of pieces? The reason the mine was never very successful is the silver veins in the mine were very weak. Okay. The silver ore was very weak. We're in veins that could technically be called silver veins, but the silver values are pathetically low. There's almost no silver in them. I know you're a big specimen collector. Do you mine? I mean, how frequently do you pull something like this out of the ground? And is there a market for specimens like this? You know, these pieces came out uh, before 2004. Okay. So over 13 or 14 years, we collected these off and on. We'd hit a pocket every year or so. So we shut the mine down, okay. having found several hundred nice things over a period of 14 years. And we probably found two dozen nice pockets. Mm -hmm. But over all the, of all the rock we moved and all the things we generated, it was quite rare. But what drove me to the mine was the quality of these crystals. And being a collector and wanting the best in the world, we had to come here to get them. 1991, when we reopened the mine, we had no idea we were gonna find any more. But we ran out of stuff. All our targets were exhausted where we were working and we had to shut the mine down in 2004. It lay dormant for, well, until 13 years. We put this tunnel in last year, hoping, hoping we might find more of these great collectible minerals. Do you see a market for these? Or, or is there a huge interest in, in specimens there's, there's, now? There's a huge interest in specimens. I'm always shocked how you can pull this out and it looks perfect. Part of the magic to make something look like that or get it out of the ground like that. Now, this is natural, by the way. These yeah. haven't been cut or polished. The, look at that, everyone. The, the, Completely natural. And that's something we should mention about specimens. To be a, a great specimen, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be monkeyed with or doctored. It can be repaired, it can be restored a little bit, but you don't polish the faces, you no. don't put crystals on it. When we were talking about probe drilling, when we hit a pocket, we have to stop, we have to back up. Then we have to carefully go in and break the rock. Instead of using explosives, we use a hydraulic splitting machine and diamond chainsaws. So we cut these pockets out. And when you, when you extract them, if you can imagine, these pockets are very, very narrow. And crystals are growing right on top of each other. So that the, the collecting process is very, very dangerous to the crystals themselves. So we develop techniques so that we damage as little as possible. Speaking of blasts, Brian actually just showed us a blast. We were able to watch it just from a few feet up there and it was pretty cool. The dust has settled while we're shooting our unboxing here and I am dying to get in and see if maybe could there be a pocket? There could be. We hope so. Let's just take a closer look. Brian, what is one thing on this piece you think our, our viewers need to learn about or that's super important? What's really important about this piece is the isolation, the separation of those crystals on Matrix, very aesthetically separated and the perfection of the crystals. And on this piece, what is something that you would love our viewers to take a closer look at. The size and the quality of such a large crystal, it's very rare to get such beautiful large crystals out of the Sweet Home Mine. All right guys, take a closer look. for your likes and subscribe. That is what got me here today. So if you wanna see more future adventures at the Gem Mines, make sure you like and subscribe. Thank you everyone for watching. I hope that you love these crystals as much as I did. I've always loved rhodochrosite, so the fact that I'm here and able to do an unboxing is pretty special. So thank you to Brian. And we're gonna go see if Brian hit it rich today. It's been a pleasure. Let's go look. Let's do it.